I hope that you received on the way in um, your program, but also a sheet of paper that has the scripture for today. It's John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. It's a little bit longer than uh, maybe we usually do in one service, so I just wanted you to have it so you could see the whole thing. We'll, we'll go through it, but you may want to look back at some verses if you are uh, following along in your Bible, John chapter 3. If you want to just sit back and relax, all of it will be on the screen, so uh, just, uh, just enjoy hearing God's word. The first verse of John chapter 3 says this, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. So this name Nicodemus, I want you to get in your head and your heart today. We're going to be uh, talking a, more about Nicodemus than you ever dreamed <laughs> was possible. And so I just want you to hold on to that name and notice in this verse that it says he was a member. He was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He was a Pharisee and he was a member. So Nicodemus, it's important to note this. He was already well acquainted with all the stuff that goes with being religious. He knew the religious scriptures, the religious practices. He was a member of the church. They didn't call it the church at that time, but in in the terms that we use, uh, just know that he was already in. He knew all the the lingo. He was a member. Verse 2 is where it gets interesting. It says, he came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Nicodemus, this member, came to Jesus at night. Most make the assumption, and I think it's a good one, that the reason Jesus, uh, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night is because he's a part of the group that are publicly criticizing Jesus and eventually will be the ones that come after him and try to have him uh, arrested and killed. Nicodemus is coming under the cover of night because he has some things that he wants to ask Jesus about. And so in that, we see uh, that Nicodemus is seeking for something more, that he's seeking. So um, some of you here, you're longtime members of a church, like, I can relate to Nicodemus. Others of you might say, well, I'm still trying to figure all this out. Well, that's what a seeker says. A seeker says, I don't understand all this. I wasn't brought up in this. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't really know that much about Jesus, but I'm drawn to him. I'm interested And so Nicodemus catches my attention because what I see in him is someone who's already in a member, and he's also a seeker. So I think this is a true statement to say you can be a member and a seeker. You can be a member and a seeker. At Providence Church, we are relentlessly committed to the seeker, to seeing people. Our vision is to see people who feel disconnected from God and the church find hope and healing and wholeness in Jesus Christ. That's my passion and focus. That's what gets me up in the morning. I heard a story this week of, of someone who'd come to our church, and they said, Jesus changed my life. I've gone from depression to hope to finding power in my life. She said, I'm singing these praise songs in my car during the week. And she said, if you knew me, you would, not, you would have no idea how crazy that is that I'm doing these things. She said, I've been pulled out of the darkness That story is enough for me to, like, get up for another month. (laughs) That's what makes my heart beat. But I've learned that a church is not just a, 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 I don't think you just have a seeker church and then a member church somewhere else. Like, you have a seeker church here, and then down the road you have this expert church where all the, the experts go. I think members should also be seekers, and that seekers should become members, What this means, uh, a learning for me, it means that members have to loosen a bit on their preferences, but they do it joyfully because they love the seeker and seeing the seeker seek and find, and they know that sometimes at night they have to go to Jesus and say, I still don't quite understand who you are. I still don't know what you're up to. I don't get it all. Nicodemus, under the cover of night, Because in that religious culture, there wasn't space for member seeker. So he goes at night in this clandestine meeting with Jesus, and I picture him whispering, saying, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God. Nobody could do the things that you're doing apart from God. But inherent in that statement, don't you see it as Nicodemus saying, but what are you up to? Who are you? What's the deal? And Jesus replies this. He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. One thing I love about the way that this story is written in John's gospel is that for some reason, I feel like I can actually picture what Nicodemus and Jesus' faces look like when they're talking, like, because it's such a normal kind of exchange. You can almost picture the expression. So uh, I've never heard a preacher or 
thought of. I'm not even sure I should do it right now, but I want to show you what I think Nicodemus' face looked like in this exchange because I think he would have had that look on his face, which is, I'm pretty sure I'm going to understand what he's going to say, and then when Jesus says it, he doesn't understand it. Right? So Jesus saying, you want to know what I'm all about? No one gets to see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. I picture Nicodemus kind of like, uh, which is the look you have when you're like, I don't know what you're talking about. But if it's really extreme, the chin goes down far. It's like, oh, <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> uh, so anyways, that amused me. Um, and Nicodemus doesn't understand. And so verse 4, he says, how can someone be born when they're old? Most people think Nicodemus was old when he, when he went to visit Jesus. Nicodemus says, surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus says, Nicodemus, you want to understand who I am? Well, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And Nicodemus tries, in this confusing kind of statement to him, he tries to exit the murky, mysterious, confusing moment by going super literal. Nicodemus has tried to be a seeker for a moment and one phrase that confuses him, and he tries to exhaust all the mystery out of it. I mean, really, how many people, if Jesus said you need to be born again, would think, are you saying I have to go back into my mother's womb? That's really literal. Nicodemus is doing what we often do when God's concepts get bigger than our brains can handle, we make them smaller. When Jesus is trying to go big, Nicodemus goes small. And we do that all the time. I do. God uh, will say, I've got something big for you. Or imagine Jacob. I feel like since I was a little boy, God's been saying, imagine Jacob trying to expand me. Conceive of my mysteries and my marvels. And so often I go small. I have a confession. Uh, one of the biggest confessions I could give you is this. Um, people pat me on the back regularly. People are really nice to me. In the lobby, you guys will, will pat me on the back, tell me I'm great, I believe you. It's an awesome system. I love it. <laughs> but more than that, we have people for some years now that say, what's going on at Providence? Something's happening there. We, we talk every week, that's not an exaggeration, to people in different churches around the country who are kind of like, what's happening there? There's a, there's a movement of God happening. I got an email this morning from a pastor in Florida that said, hey, Pastor Jacob, can I have a phone call with you? I just kind of want to hear, like, what's going on? Because God's doing something here. And so people will say things to me. This is just me being honest. They'll say, because people like to put it on a person. They'll say, you're a big dreamer, aren't you? You must be a real big vision kind of guy. I've heard that many times. But here's what I know, really. Most times, I go small. That's the confession. Most of the times when God is expanding and placing something big before me, I try to pare it down to something that makes sense to me, that I can plan, and that I'm comfortable with. And that's what I come and present. When I dream big for just a moment, in a moment where I, begin, where I can get out of that, making it small, and I begin to dream big. I hear God saying, Jacob, could you, could you dream with me about a community where every kid has food, where there's, where there's no hungry kids in our, in our public schools? I have, I have God asking me to dream. Could you dream about a place where kids are not beaten and abused, which is happening in our county? Jacob, could you dream about a place, this community, where, where black students have the exact same opportunities as white what would it be like if, if no woman runs from their house afraid in the middle of the night, which is happening in our community? Do you want to see it, God asks me, a community of black and white and brown where there's no drug epidemic that's killing our children? And, and God begins to, to expand me, and, and I start thinking things like, I think today I'll worry about the budget. I think I'm going to take today and just worry about the budget. I think today I'll let some kind of conflict consume all of my mind. I think today, instead of dreaming big, I'll, I'll, I'll let the small consume me. I'll go to bed early. I don't know what God is dreaming for your life, but if you feel him beginning to expand you a bit, don't go small just because that's what makes sense to you. Don't go small just because that's what seems to fit in your brain right now. That's what you can plan. That's what you can be comfortable with. Nicodemus gets small, real small, real literal. He says, Jesus, surely you aren't talking about us entering our mother's bellies again and being born a second time. And this is where I can picture Jesus' face kind of like, 
Uh, no, that's not what I'm saying. That's weird. That's gross. You know, why, why, would, he, why would anyone even say that, you know? I'm saying, Jesus, I'm saying you could have a new birth, a rebirth, a, a born again experience. I'm not talking about going back into your mother's womb, but I am saying it's like that. It's that dramatic. It's, it's, it's like that, Nicodemus. It's like when your mother's water broke and she cried out for your dad and said, come now, the moment's here, the child we've been waiting for, our son, we don't even know what he's going to be like. We don't know what his personality will be. We don't know how he will grow. We don't know how he'll change our hearts, but we know he will change our hearts. We don't know how we'll cry, how we'll laugh, how we'll shout, how we'll need to be quiet in the presence of our child. He'll come wet and with blood and gasping for breath, and we'll do everything we can do to embrace this new life, knowing that we can't control this new life because that's the very nature of new life. Jesus is saying, I want you, Nicodemus, to get born again like that. Not literally go back into your mother's womb, but a, but a new birth in the spirit. Jesus answers Nicodemus in verse five, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they're born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. And furthermore, he says to Nicodemus, you should not be surprised at me saying, you must be born again. He's saying to Nicodemus, you shouldn't be surprised by this kind of talk, you know why? You're a member. You're one of Israel's teachers. Go back and read Ezekiel where it says, I'll give you a new heart. I'll do a new life in you. Rebirth is the kind of talk of the people of God. It should be our very expectation. That's what we should be talking about. Are you being reborn? What new thing is God doing? Where's the spirit moving in your life that's surprising you that's, that's so dramatic? It's like, like being born again. In verse 8, Jesus says, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. I have no idea what that verse means. It totally confuses me. So we're moving on to verse 9. John chapter 3, verse, in a few years, I'll be like, I figured out John 3, 8, but not today. I spent all week looking at it. John 3, 9, though, Nicodemus says, how can this be? This, this spirit rebirth, how can this be? And I'm going to read to you several verses now, so just kind of let Jesus' words, the rhythm of it, sink into your heart. Okay, I'm going to read about four verses. He says, you're Israel's teacher, and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know, and we testify to that we've seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. If you're sort of normal, all that would be just kind of stirring around in your head. You wouldn't be able to say, I know exactly what that means. I get all that. And Jesus has this word here where he's referring back. He says, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. He's referring to an obscure story in their story, the people of God's story, when they were the, the Israelites, they'd been escaped from slavery, and now they're wandering through the wilderness. But this is not one of the main stories. This is not what just the people in culture would have known. They would have heard of Mount Sinai or the great Ten Commandments or crossing the Red Sea. This is a tiny story. I'll tell you what it is. It's a tiny story. The Israelites are wandering through the wilderness. People are getting bit by poisonous snakes. They've been disobedient to God, and there's these poisonous snakes that are biting them. Moses calls out to God, help. And God says, make a snake. Make a, he makes a bronze snake. He puts it on a pole. And God says, if you lift up the, the bronze snake on the pole up above the Israelites, there's thousands of them. If you lift up the snake up on the pole, the people who've been, been bit by the poisonous snakes will live. Anybody who can see the snake up on the pole will be saved. Now, who would know that story? Nicodemus. He's a member. He'd studied it in school. He'd grown up hearing it in his family. And Jesus says, I'm like that. If I'm lifted up, I will save. And so then uh, Jesus says, everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. All of that stuff, right? All that stuff, the kingdom of God, born again, the wind blows wherever it pleases, the snake on the pole. It's almost too much for even a member, isn't it? What are you getting at, Jesus? Everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. That's Jesus' conclusion. And then I don't know if you've seen it coming. Some of you members have seen it coming. The very next verse in the story says this. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible, maybe, is told to sum up Nicodemus' mysterious, confusing nighttime encounter with Jesus. Like the most evangelistic verse in the Bible, the thing that we would think, this is for the person who's far off, was actually given to a member who came to Jesus saying, I don't fully understand. God loves the world so much, that's you, that he gave Jesus, and whoever believes in him won't die, but will live forever. If you believe in Jesus, you won't die. You need to know that. If you believe in Jesus, you won't die. Your body here will die, but the you, your soul, we have a promise of life that comes after this, a new body and a new life. And there's more. (laughs) The story goes on and it says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. If you ever wonder, maybe you're a seeker, if you ever wonder what Jesus is all about, wonder no longer. He didn't come to condemn, he came to save. He did not, it's clear, he did not come to condemn the world, he came to save the world. Purpose is really important. Jesus' purpose. It goes on to say, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Condemnation doesn't come in Jesus. It comes apart from Jesus. If you're living in condemnation right now, you are not being condemned by Jesus. We're told that he didn't come to condemn. You're being condemned outside of Jesus. If you're condemning yourself like some of us are, we're in a self-condemnation season of our life, step out of the darkness and step into the light which is not me adding another metaphor to this story where we already have several. It's Jesus doing it. This is the verdict, is the next verse. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light. Can you imagine? People love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. Those of us walking in darkness, we fear that coming into the light, that's going to be a moment of exposure for us, right? We're going to be, I don't know what, you know, we get, we'll, we'll get struck dead or hurt or whatever. And so we fear the light. We fear what will happen in the light, so we just stay in the darkness. But listen to how this ends, our last verse. Whoever believes, whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly what they've been done has been done in the sight of God. The darkness is a farce. The darkness is a trick. We think, I can't face God, so I'll stay in the darkness, right? I don't want all that stuff to be exposed. But Jesus says, no, God knows what's happening in the darkness, same as the light. (laughs) So step into the light, not to be condemned, to be saved. So many times in my life I've been scared to step into the light because I'm like, oh, everything's going to be found out and I'll I'll be condemned. No, stepping into the light, into God's light, is a place where salvation happens, not condemnation happens. But when we stay apart from God, We stay in the darkness. So step out of darkness. Step into light so you can be saved. Often what I see us doing is we hear a bit of the wonder of God, like we've heard today, this this amazing story, and we shrink it down. Preachers do this. We shrink it down to something we can manage when when what God wants to do is actually as dramatic as us being born again. It's actually as dramatic as being in darkness and stepping into light. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., in a speech on August the 16th of 1967, it was a speech about uh, social um, and economic inequality. Uh, It had a lot to do with race, as you can imagine, but it also had to do with uh, uh, cycles of poverty in America that were already going on for a long time in the 1960s. The speech was called, Where Do We Go From Here? That might be a good speech today, I don't know. Where do we go from here? And Dr. King said, so he's given this speech about uh, social and economic equality, and then he says, and if you'll let me be a preacher just a little bit. That's what caught my attention in this speech. Because when a good preacher says, and if you'll let me be a preacher just a little bit, that's, your, that's our cue to know this is, this is about to get good, right? And Dr. King was a great preacher. And so he said, if you'll let me be a preacher just a little bit, then I'm going to quote. He says, one night, a man came to Jesus, and he wanted to know what he could do to be saved. 
Dr. King is invoking Nicodemus in his speech. One night, a man came to Jesus. He wanted to know what he could do to be saved. And Jesus didn't get bogged down on the kind of isolated approach of what you shouldn't do. Jesus didn't say, now, Nicodemus, you must stop lying. He didn't say, now, Nicodemus, you must not commit adultery. He didn't say, now, Nicodemus, you must stop cheating if you're doing that. He didn't say, now, Nicodemus, you must stop drinking liquor if you're doing that excessively. He said something altogether different because Jesus realized something basic. I'm quoting Dr. King. He says, if a man will lie, he will steal. And if he will steal, he will kill. So instead of just getting bogged down on one thing, Jesus looked at him and said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. In other words, your whole structure must be changed. Dr. King's point was a country that will keep people in slavery for 244 years has already made things out of people and will continue to exploit them by race or poverty or whatever for generations to come. His point was, we can't just address a problem. We have a big problem that needs to be born again. And you know what? Will you let me be a preacher just a little bit? All your problems are tied together. All your stuff, all my stuff, it's not about one thing, like you need to stop lying if you're, if you're lying. Most of us have no hope if we're just going to try to correct behavior. What do we need? We need to be born again. And this applies to seekers and members. I wonder if anybody here today needs to be born again. So we've been left to wonder, people have been left to wonder for years. Maybe you're wondering, what did Nicodemus do? I know no one's really wondering that. It's just kind of a preacher thing. <laughs> <Set up. laughs> what did Nicodemus do? Did he believe? Was Nicodemus born again? Well, here's what we know. When Jesus was handed over and mocked and beaten, he was then lifted up on a pole. We don't know if Nicodemus was right there, but chances are really good, and I'll tell you why in a second. Chances are really good that Nicodemus saw Jesus lifted up high above the people on a pole, just like Moses lifted the snake up, and whoever looked at the snake would be saved. He was lifted up above all the people. You following me? Because no sooner was Jesus dead Guess who came on the scene? Nicodemus. I'm serious. I'm serious. It's in John chapter 19. After Jesus died, one of Jesus' disciples, a person referred to as a disciple of Christ, his name was Joseph of Arimathea, went with Nicodemus and took Jesus' body. Let me read the scripture to you from John 19. He, that's Joseph of Arimathea, this disciple of Christ, was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Picture an old man carrying 75 pounds of spices. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices in strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. This is what you did for a member and at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Nicodemus took the one who had hung in public disgrace, took his battered body in his hands, wrapped Jesus' body with spices, strips of linen, covered his body. And he was there, maybe one of the ones, or was at least present, when a stone was rolled in front of the tomb. So you tell me if you think Nicodemus believed. You tell me if something happened that night when he went and, went and met with him. My imagination, that's an important phrase for the rest of what I'm going to say, okay? My imagination leads me to believe Nicodemus would have heard that the stone was rolled away. My imagination, which God is asking me to make bigger, leads me to think that the one who put Jesus in the tomb would have gone to look at the tomb for himself and see if it was empty. It's very possible that since Nicodemus was hanging out with Joseph of Arimathea and the disciples of Jesus, that he could have been hiding out in one of those rooms with the disciples when Jesus came and walked through locked doors and showed his friends that indeed he was not dead. No, something had happened that had never happened before. He was born again. Jesus did not go back 
into the womb, he went into a tomb. He was not born of, of water, he was born of the Spirit. And the Spirit of God woke up his bones, made his sinews and muscles attach and come back to life, and his heart beat again, and blood that had sat stagnant in veins began to flow, and Jesus got up and walked out of darkness into light. I imagine that Nicodemus could have actually seen and touched Jesus' dead body and then see and touch his body alive. Very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they're born again. So this is what I think. Jesus changed Nicodemus' life. I mean, <laughs> changed his life. A guy who was a part of the Jewish ruling council and a Pharisee who were the ones who, who were a part of sending Jesus to the cross went and grabbed his body. I believe that Nicodemus' life was changed. I think he was a member and a seeker. That's what I want to be. I want to be a member. Like, I don't want to discount membership. I want to be a member. I want to grow every day. I want to study his scriptures. I want to come here every week. I want to encounter even the, even the hard ones. I want to be obedient. I want to hear the stories over and over and over. And I want my kids to hear them over and over and over. I want my burial to be a Christian burial with the rituals that go with the ones as a part of the people that believe in the power of the resurrection. And we proclaim it even in death. And I know that there are a bunch of members in this room right now who are still seeking. And I also know there are a bunch of seekers in this room who are going to become members and so I have to ask you this question, do you want to be born again? Do you want to be born again? Because I want to be born again. <laughs> I want the same spirit the scriptures tell us that conquered sin and death on the cross to live in me. I want to live my life not as an afraid person who makes things smaller and goes to bed earlier, but believes that I have that same power in me, and so I can walk out of the darkness of my anxiety you can walk out of the darkness of your depression. You can walk out of the darkness of this situation that you're in and you see no way out. You can walk right out of it into the light. And it's not a place that you're gonna be exposed. It's not a place for condemnation. It's a place for you to just actually get saved from it all. That's what Jesus can do. As Mark has already done, I wanna invite you to Thursday night. I hope all of you will come. I have no idea how that will work, but I hope all of you will come. And... If you need to say yes to Jesus through baptism, you've never been baptized before, uh, go to that link and sign up, and Mark and I will contact you, and we'll get you ready for Thursday night. Uh, if you know you're at a place where you need to make a recommitment, we already have dozens and dozens of people who are saying, saying that. Uh, you can come that night and go to that same link, and there's a place for a recommitment. You can have water put on your head and remember your baptism, or if you want to go under the water as a way of remembering that, just have a marker in your life, uh, you can do that. Also that night, this may be for you, we're gonna have time during worship where you can go to some corners of the room where there'll be pastors and you can have people pray for you. You're just in a place, I need somebody to pray for me. If you need healing in your life, um, we'll have pastors there with oil that will anoint you with oil. That's something Christians do. And we'll anoint you with oil and pray for healing. I had a grandmother come up to me after one of our services and she told me about her, her brand new uh, granddaughter and um, who was born with some things that, are, that, that need some fixing. And they're working with doctors on that. She's like, can I bring my granddaughter and, and pray for healing? I said, yes. So if you've got something in your life where you need healing, just take notice of this, this night. We believe that God's gonna do some things that will be you know, expansive, bigger than, than we have imagined. Let's pray together. Oh God, thank you. We get excited thinking about how we're like Nicodemus and how we can come to you and not have it all figured out, but you tell us the truth and you offer us life. And so we wanna be people of truth and life. We pray uh, as we come to communion that this bread would actually be for us the body of Christ, broken for us. That the cup of juice would be his blood shed for us for the forgiveness of sins. There's nothing we could, can't be forgiven for. So this morning, let us receive Jesus. In his name we pray, amen.